Okay, I think it's uh, it's about time that we get started here. Um, um, it's my pleasure today to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Cantor, uh, who's an expert. Can I have uh, both? Who is an expert in um, child abuse pediatrics, and she'll be presenting the webinar with me uh, today. Uh, just to do a little bit of housekeeping about the webinar, uh, it'll be about 50 minutes of presentation by Dr. Chanter, uh, after which we'll open up the session to a 10 to 15 minute question and answer session. Uh, while the Q&A will be at the end of today's webinar, please feel free to submit your questions at any time uh, throughout the presentation and uh, using the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, by way of introduction, Dr. Cantor is a highly qualified academic and clinical expert in areas of pediatrics, and forensic pediatrics, and life and everything. She is a professor of pediatrics at New York Medical College and director of child abuse pediatrics at Westchester Medical Center. Dr. Cantor has extensive research, so clinical, and academic expertise in areas of physical abuse, child accidents, child fatalities, child product uses, and life care planning related to catastrophic in injury. Dr. Cantor received her BA and MPH from Johns Hopkins University, as well as her MD from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Her residency was in pediatrics at the Montefiore Medical Center slash Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and her fellowship in child abuse pediatrics and forensic pediatrics was completed at the Hackensack University Medical Center, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. She's also board certified in pediatrics and child abuse pediatrics. Uh, she's published extensively in her field and is a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Science and is a certified physician life care planner. Uh, so once again, thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. And please welcome Dr. Jennifer Cantor. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to make sure everybody can see my slides. Okay. So if you could just put in the chat box if there's any problem seeing my slides, that would be great. And thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to start off this presentation just giving you an outline of what the webinar will be about today. And when you're facing a case of a potential injury due to a child product, the questions really to analyze would be, first of all, was what is reported to be an injury diagnosed accurately? Is it, is it really that fracture? Is it really that head injury? Is it really that burn that it was ascribed to be? Second, is the mechanism that was reported consistent with the injury? Third, are there other mechanisms to entertain as plausible alternatives to explain the injuries? And that's where the interface between forensic pediatrics and injuries from products comes in because many times we're faced as forensic pediatricians with cases involving a child product and have to determine whether or not the mechanism matches the injury. Fourth would be, was the product being used properly? And in this presentation, we're going to go through some examples of products being used, but perhaps not the way they were intended to be. Then always considering supervision of a child in the context of using a product, even if the product is being used as intended, the proper supervision of the child is also something important to consider when analyzing these cases. And finally, being a research geek, I love to look in the literature and see what else might be out there related to these products as um, doing an analysis of the case and also generate our, our, our own research in the context of my work with our child fatality review teams, seeing many children who have died mostly related to sleep products and bathing products, some of those I'm going to talk about today. We're going to go through uh, products related to sleep, incidents of choking, 
burns, drowning, fractures, and dabble a little bit in car seats. So first I mentioned to make sure that the injury reported as being there is truly there. Um, some of the images that you will see might be somewhat unpleasant. I really should have said that before I put this slide up. But um, I actually spared you from some of the worst ones thanks to our organizer. He uh, was my barometer for uh, taking out some that were a little bit worse. So there are uh, injury imitators or abuse imitators or accident imitators that we uh, use in the field of forensic pediatrics both with the skin and, and uh, the, the bones and head injury, things that you might think are actually an injury, but are not an injury. So if you look at the picture on the left, you see a child who kind of looks like they had some water splashed on their chest or something like that. And this is actually a skin condition called phytophytodermatitis. It's an allergic reaction usually to citrus fruits. The second picture certainly looks like a burn on the buttocks, the big blister, and that's actually a, a senna ingestion, a child who got into some X-lax and liked the chocolate flavor, and as the X-lax goes through the system, this is the reaction it has on the skin. So these are some pretty benign examples of things that look like an injury that actually might not be what they appear to be. And here's another one. This is actually a child who was airlifted to our facility, I, I believe, with a history of having been injured by uh, being splashed with bleach in some kind of laundry incident or accident. And it turned out that this was a skin infection called strep infantigo, and it wasn't at all what it was thought to be. And the child was interviewed multiple times in very leading and suggestive ways, and he had some disabilities. So the case started off as a, a train in one direction, and when we were able to separate out the parts, getting the facts straight really helped to see the case in an objective manner. So in terms of a differential diagnosis, uh, for any of you who don't know what a differential diagnosis is, if you go to the doctor and say, I have a headache, the differential diagnosis would include migraines, a brain tumor, you're making it up so you don't have to go to work the next day, all the things that could possibly explain a headache. So with skin findings in children, we have to think about abuse accidents, bleeding disorders, some genetic conditions, something called iatrogenic injury, which is injury produced by medical intervention. So sometimes when children are intubated or even have blood draws, you might see bruising or marks that we have to distinguish as having happened before or after the medical intervention. Infections, allergies, and skin conditions can also cause elements that look like they might have been an injury. Locations of marks and bruises and the consistency as to whether or not they are inflicted or accidental is really also important in the context of product injuries. Accidents usually um, in mobile children will have marks on bony prominences, places on our body that are over boats, the shins, the forehead, the hips, the ankles. But when injuries are inflicted, they would be in locations that aren't over bones, such as your, the cheeks of your face, your buttocks, your neck, um, and your ears. So that comes into play sometimes when we have a report of a child being injured with a product, but it doesn't quite match the mechanism. Similarly to uh, skin findings, fractures also have a differential diagnosis that you need to weed through before accepting an injury as an injury. It could be abuse, an accident, a genetic disorder, an endocrine problem, malignancies, infections, immobility, and even birth trauma can cause some types of fractures. 
And finally, head injury also has a very wide differential diagnosis, abuse, accidents, certain genetic disorders, birth trauma, metabolic problems, infections, bleeding disorders, and issues with blood vessels. So if you have a case, for example, involving a fall, um, some types of injuries are consistent with a fall and some aren't, but there very well may be something that's incidental that's found that's related to another medical condition that has to be teased out. Many, many of the cases analyzed in forensic pediatrics, and I'm sure in all of your practices, involve the death of a young child. And I want to just go through some terminology. This applies in, in most circumstances to cases involving unsafe sleep, which is a big part of my uh, research background is in unsafe sleep and prevention and education for families on that. So. The American Academy of Pediatrics uh, uses the term SUID, sudden unexplained infant death, as an umbrella term that includes all of the reasons why children may die unexpectedly under the age of one. And you see that purple box on top, SID, sudden infant death syndrome, that is a subset of SUID and it is when there's no explanation at all for, for uh, the death after an autopsy, there's no cofactors, there's nothing that may explain the death. So that would be a child who's sleeping safely on their back in a crib with no pillows, blankets, or toys, doesn't have a fever, doesn't have a medical problem, and they simply died and no one knows why. The majority of cases that we see where children die unexpectedly are in those yellow boxes where there's some potential for unsafe sleep, either um, asphyxiation where a substance is interfering with oxygenation, uh, the air supply being blocked, like a blanket being over or next to the face, or entrapment, a child who gets stuck or in a, inside of a crib. Okay, moving on. The timing of injuries is a field in and of itself to understand what you can actually say, you know, time of death um, and how you can depend on the body temperature and the appearance of the skin, all of those really uh, dive into the forensic pathology world. And then with living children, we can say that bruises cannot be dated. And that was old school science. When I was in medical school uh, back you know, 20 years ago, we learned that a bruise that was blue was two days old and purple was three days old and yellow was, we had this whole schematic that has since been uh, disproven. And bruises have tremendous variability in the actual dating due to the depth of the bruise, the location, skin color, and even the examiner's variability, you say tomato, I say tomato. It's very different what one might see and document as uh, compared to another physician. Fractures can be dated, but within very rough windows. We classify them as acute, which is usually less than 10 days, uh, subacute, which is a, a week, a couple of weeks, and then a chronic, which would be usually more than a month. Um, head injury can sometimes be dated based on imaging, but also based on symptoms. And fatalities, as I said, uh, we really have to synthesize all of the information uh, based on the investigation and medical findings, knowing that both in the context of accidents, potential abuse, and all of you being, mostly, most of you being attorneys, knowing that history may be unreliable when a child is injured. So I thought I'd go through some of the typical developmental milestones in children that are very widely disseminated. This is actually a chart from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we know in medicine what a kid who's three months, four months, six months, nine months, two years, three years, five years, what they should be doing if they're developmentally on par. So comparing what the history is 
with what the appropriate development should be, as long as the records indicate the child is progressing appropriately, can really help to discern if an injury is consistent with the mechanism. So if you have a story that a four-month-old child walked across the room, you obviously know a four-month-old child is not going to pull to stand. So I just pointed that one out with the red arrow. But if you take a moment, you can see the motor, um, motor fine motor milestones that are involved with, with kids like this. That's why children uh, choking on small parts, really, it's not as much of a concern in the one, two, three, four month old. It's much more of a concern as children start to put things into their mouths. And moving on, for example, an eight month old baby may put a small part into his or her mouth because they're starting to finger feed. So when you're looking at a case, and I, re, I, I do evaluations for plaintiff, defense, criminal, family, like kind of our, our the bread and butter of, of forensic pediatric practice is most things are kids who come in with different kinds of injuries. And this applies for anything. I mean, I think if you're evaluating a case, either plaintiff or, or defense, you want to make sure that the, the history is accurate. Um, some red flags for potential abuse would be when there's no explanation or a vague explanation for uh, an injury that's significant, when a detail in the history changes dramatically, when the explanation is inconsistent with the pattern, age, or severity of the injury, uh, when the explanation is inconsistent with the physical or developmental capabilities, which is the previous slides that we just went through, when, and this is where the world of investigation comes in and your depositions, uh, different witnesses provide markedly different explanations, or when additional injuries are uncovered during a medical workup. Uh, I've been pretty careful in this presentation to change details of different cases, and I can't really talk about active cases, but I, I am working on something right now where an additional injury was uncovered when a certain mechanism was reported to be related to a product and it turned out to go down the road of being uh, abuse. So, for example, what should happen when a, when a kid falls? Short falls result in minor trauma, such as bruising, a linear skull fracture, which is just a straight line or a broken arm. Um, the descriptions of, you need to get descriptions of the mechanism from the caretaker, understand the progression of symptoms before and after the fall, the developmental capabilities of the child who has access in determining whether or not an injury is consistent with the mechanism reported. So if I'm faced with a child who has really severe injuries after a reported short fall, that might not quite match. And sometimes, as you know, that relates to products because children can fall off of products or have products fall onto them, such as our television tumble cases and dressers falling. So these are important uh, components to pay attention to in determining consistency of injury. This is a great example, uh, a case I looked at a number of years ago. A parent was reported to have been changing a baby's uh, diaper on that drawer, that, that, that dresser on the left side, and, and kind of the kid was on the edge and the guy was standing there. And when we got deeper into the case, he had mentioned, that I, I noticed this, um, this play mat on the, on the right side, and he was actually using that thinking that that was going to make changing the child there safer. And we'll get to a little bit more about that in a moment. Well, the weirdest thing happened. It turns out that the child is reported to have scooched next to what you see in the corner there, which is an open washing machine filled with what was reported to be very hot water. So this was actually a, a case involving uh, I was, I was evaluating for defense and the uh, lawsuit was against the heating company. 
so and I know you, you can't comment back to me and I don't know if I can see any questions if you put them into this thing or not but I imagine when you see the next picture it's a bit bit unsettling so this is what happened to the child after reportedly scooching off of here falling into this tub and the father by report immediately grabbing the child and pulling the child out but had a couple of times when the kid was slipping from him. So immediately the, the pattern really wasn't quite matching the, uh, the reported mechanism. It just wasn't quite making sense for a variety of reasons. The water setting was hot. It was super hot. It was over 160, I, I believe. But the dad had no burns on his hands and he reported having to reach in a number of times to pull the child out. The pattern didn't match the child falling in the way the father said it had. And what it came down to was concerns about some safety and supervision and the story didn't quite uh, match how it was being described. And curiously, I went back and took a look at this product. I ordered it myself on Amazon just to see what that was about. And it turns out that this was a, an infant playmat. I'm going to uh, scoot ahead here. The marketing and instruction materials said it's for it's floor based, but dad it, for, for playing on the floor. It has nothing to do with changing. And dad actually in his deposition talked about using that mat because it was intended to change diapers which it absolutely wasn't. A safe changing mat would have some kind of traction underneath of it or a belt. And this was far from it. In fact, it was very slippery, probably why it was easier for the child to somehow scooch into the water however he did. And it was my opinion in that case that parental neglect caused the incident and there were some inconsistencies with the whole story that a reasonably prudent parent would have recognized this setup as a danger. And the parents had made some statements in their depositions of that, of kind of affirming that. This was a foreseeable event and that the father's initial account that um, he just wasn't really watching his son the entire time he was in there, it really came out to, you know, that's kind of how the case ended up getting resolved. So, the interesting thing in that case is looking at burns, you can have a burn in just seconds when water is super high, super hot, over 160 degrees was the report in that case. If you use the trajectory here, you can see that in a half a second, you're going to have a burn at 160. But burns are a function of time and temperature. So the longer that you're in water, that is uh, cooler, the higher chance you'll be burned. So you can get the same kind of burn for a shorter period in a higher temperature or a longer period in a lower temperature, which is where my opinion that it was not consistent came in because the father had no burns, but the child had very significant and severe burns, meaning that the child was probably in the water much longer than the father said which is why when dad reached in to temperatures that were not 160 degrees, he um, did not himself get burned. Okay, so moving on to anticipatory guidance, um, there are a variety of topics that parents and, and pediatricians go over in the office to prevent injuries and accidents in children. And I want you to be aware of that so you'd have a barometer for what parents are learning in the pediatrician's office. They certainly have, these are taken right from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the, a safe place for your child when you're cooking, make sure they're in a playpen or a crib or an activity center, what to do when a child gets burned, having a smoke alarm. So whatever kind of case you're looking at, it is good to know what advice, what anticipatory guidance was given to the family in the context of, of that case, what they knew before the injury happened. And there's similar education on topics of safe sleep falls, car seats, poisons, burns, drowning, choking, window guards, and guns. 
those are the main topics that are, are gone through in anticipatory guidance for safety. And for example, at the newborn visit, they'll go over car seats, but at the nine month visit, they start to go over firearm safety and burns. So the, the, the anticipatory guidance is also concordant with the child's development. Okay, so shifting gears for a minute, uh, there's been many, many times when our, our world of the evaluation of potential abuse and neglect uh, comes to somebody who's not done a case in that world before. So I want to tell you uh, what all these things mean and most importantly, what information may be out there when you're evaluating a case that you might not know actually is there that you can uh, take a look at. So usually in the case of an unexplained injury or product injury, many times you're going to have a report to Child Protective Services when they present to the hospital because somebody in, in the context will be concerned either about inconsistency of injury or about supervision or neglect, uh, which is where my world collides with this product liability world. So what happens when an, an individual who's a mandated reporter is a professional who in their capacity, working as a doctor, a teacher, whatever it may be, um, is concerned that a person legally responsible either a abused or caused to be abused a child and that would be physical abuse sexual abuse or neglect is where some of these cases come in that kind of case in all 50 states is uh, traditionally evaluated along with law enforcement in the context of what's called a multidisciplinary team which are entities that have a state uh, approved information sharing capacity so we work with the district attorneys, uh, mental health providers, medical, child protective services, and law enforcement to share information about what everyone has in a particular case. Sometimes children are interviewed at a place called a child advocacy center, such as siblings that might have witnessed a certain accident or, or incident. I had a case of a child who choked on a ball bearing and died for a, a major manufacturer. I was uh, I was doing it for also on behalf of defense. And some siblings had been interviewed at a child advocacy center. And part of that analysis was uh, looking at those materials. There's also an entity called the child fatality review team that when a child dies unexpectedly in most municipalities, there is an extensive review, pro review process that includes the members of the multidisciplinary team and potentially uh, getting involved more in the community or actually looking at the product, if it's a product case, looking at the product itself. And I'm gonna go through an example of that that we had in, in, at our own team here in New York. In New York. And two, references that you might want to learn a little bit more about this are provided at the bottom of this slide. What's interesting and why I thought we could go through this is the amount of variables that are collected in child death review is over 1600 variables per case that are collected. Um, everything from child, family, primary caregivers, supervisors, perpetrators, of prior abuse incidents, details about the incident, the place, the method of death, it is a tremendous, crazy detailed questionnaire that uh, really covers, this is a good summary of this from, uh, from a publication in 2014, that you can really learn a lot about by evaluating these, these data points. Uh, when I start looking at a case, the first thing I do is tell the attorney, look, this is what I'm gonna need in order to get the answers to the questions you're asking me. I'm a straight shooter, I'll tell you what I think, this is the information I need. And there's often a lot more there than you might have at your disposal. Okay, shifting gears again, we all, I'm sure, know the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which is an independent federal reg regulatory agency with a mission to protect the public um, in against unreasonable risks and injury. And they do that by developing voluntary standards with organizations, manufacturers, and businesses and issue and enforcing mandatory standards or banning consumer products if no feasible standard would adequately protect the public. 
and handling recalls of products and informing and educating consumers about such uh, recalls. Slide problem here. Okay, um, this is a bit, this slide I have to come back to because I forgot why I put it there. Oh, okay, so the CPSC is, here we go, let me just go ahead here. CPSC is obviously uh, responsible for regulating the small parts, um, small parts uh, standards. And you know, children who are young are potentially uh, prone to ingesting small parts, usually the age of three and under, but the, the age of five and under, or even older, the child with a developmental disability. And the American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement has a choking as a leading cause of morbidity and mortality amongst children, especially three and younger, with food, coins, and toys as a primary cause of choking, and recommends the CPSC uh, definitely continues to ensure that toys have proper choking warning labels. One thing that I've experienced in practice is the warning labels not being in languages that uh, consumers may under, they understand, but also people who might not be able to read and have to rely on scrunching their eyes and trying to figure out what, what, they're, what they're looking at. And I had put this, um, this picture of a, a small part inside of an airway. Okay, and moving on to what, what are unsafe Food for toddlers, and if you have any food choking uh, analysis, this is also available on the American Academy of Pediatrics. I've had a case here and there where children have choked in a school setting, and the question would be: Is was that an appropriate food for the child to have, given their age or developmental status? The American Academy of Pediatrics does advise parents how to buy safe toys. And that's another thing where it comes into supervision and proper product use. Do you use a Nerf gun with small little beetles in a child who's two who might pick it up and ingest it? And I didn't mean Nerf by any uh, 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 product name. I'm just using that as a general, general term. Um, now let's move on to safe infant sleep. We've done a tremendous amount. That's actually me in the middle for that terrible face on me talking. Um, this is an example of a safe sleep setting. It's a, a crib where a child is lying on his back with no pillows, blankets, bumpers, an empty crib. And we'll go through the main, the, the three main components of safe sleep, although there are actually 18 that are part of the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, most recent guidelines. Children are safest when they sleep alone with no soft objects or loose bedding. There's a five-fold increase in sleep-related death independent of sleep position when there is loose bedding or soft objects. And when an infant is also placed on their tummy, and we'll get to sleep position in a second, the increase is 21 times. So if a child is on their tummy and has soft bedding, it's 21 times risk of infant death and if the child was on their back without um, without soft objects. Soft objects include pillows, toys, quilts, comforters, blankets, and even infant sleep clothing that can become a, a loose object, such as a swaddle that a child can break free of. Children should be entirely supine or on their back. Now, kids will roll over. So a child placed on their back who's now four or five months is going to roll onto their tummy that's fine. As long as they're placed onto their back, they're going to have the stomach strength that they roll over onto their stomach to recover their seat position themselves because their stomach control can let them do that. That being said, that's all the more reason why under the age of one, there should not be soft toys, soft like pillows, blankets inside the sleep environment because children can get wrapped up in those blankets and not be able to recover their airway. And finally, sleeping on a firm surface, there's been a number of really unsafe products that were marketed for sleep or naps or whatever the case may be, and they simply were not safe, and children have died 
uh, the the ABCs alone back and now crib. There should be a firm mattress with no gaps that's designed for the specific product. And babies uh, should not be sleeping on beds, car seats, strollers, swings, infant carriers, and they need to adhere to manufacturer's guidelines. Okay, and I'm just giving you some examples of kids who have died and what their beds have looked like. And you see here uh, what's unsafe here is there's a there's a mobile in this uh, in this crib. And what's unsafe about that is when a child starts to pull to stand, they can actually choke on or get strangulation on a mobile, pull it down, get injured from it falling on them. There's all kinds of stuff in this crib, and this was uh, an unsafe sleep death in an older child and one. This was an unsafe sleep death in a four-month-old. Everything that could be wrong was wrong in this case. This is not a child who's uh, firmly on their back and they're certainly uh, sleeping on a, on a sheet skin. And uh, this is a very unfortunate case. Um, then uh, brought, bringing me to the interface of products with child fatality review teams, uh, we in, in my county saw a number of children die sequentially sleeping on infant support pillows, which are those U-shaped pillows. It started with a three-month-old that actually had a significant abuse history and mental health issue with parents. And one night, dad hears a weird sound, the baby was blue and limp. But on autopsy also had multiple old rib fractures, bringing us back to making sure that what looks like it might be a product-ish kind of situation is not actually abuse. And that, in my recollection, is that child was actually intentionally suffocated. But it got us to look at uh, these infant support pillows. And this is another kid who died. We ended up coming up with seven cases. This is this is my own. This is unpublished research for a good reason, and I'll I'll get to why it was not published in a moment. Uh, we collected data on seven kids who died with a U-shaped support pillow in the environment over a pretty short period of time, just over a couple of years. And some of them, you know, some of them like the case three, a two-month-old found unresponsive, face down in the center of a crescent-shaped pillow and a blanket on the floor. Uh, the third one, uh, the two-month-old was found unresponsive, lying on his side in the center of the crescent-shaped pillow. Um, and we did work with the CPSC, and they met, they met with our team. And it actually, I, I somewhat agreed with their assessment that they couldn't uh, attribute the death to the product because it was unclear exactly how the baby died. There was also pillows. There was this. There was that. And uh, because of that, the, the, the denominator of how many people use these pillows over the numerator of the deaths, there was no statistically valid way to say that these pillows in and of themselves were causing children to die. Rather, it was the improper use of a properly labeled product that may have contributed to these deaths. Hence why my paper wasn't published, because there we could not uh, directly do a, a causal association between the pillows and the deaths. Um, another kind of example of this is infant sleep positioners. This is a Consumer Product Safety Commission spreadsheet on sleep positioner cases. And what they did with these is issued a, quote, warning in 2012. It, I believe this is from the New York Times. And they urge parents and caregivers to take our warning seriously and stop using sleep positioners. And reiterated that in 2017. And what I decided to do as I was putting this presentation together, just to go on Amazon, and this is a screenshot. I started putting this together in December of this presentation. I just put it in. And what did I come up with is a bunch of sleep positioners. So you think you're a new mom and you're having a baby shower and you want to get stuff, how on earth are you going to know what's safe and not safe and how are these products labeled? It can be very, very confusing for families when uh, something might not be safe, but they're still finding it on the market. And I found this one and I tried to go, I, I couldn't find what company it was from, couldn't find the instructions, but I can certainly tell you, I would call this a death trap. This is a very, very unsafe sleep environment. I found it right on Amazon. 
I did try to find out what the company was and I, I couldn't track it down. Uh, crib bumpers is another hot topic where the current view of the Consumer Product Safety Commission is that there's not evidence to actually truly make the connection between the bumpers and the gaps. And it is a very hot topic in terms of legislation. There's a number of municipalities that have, quote, banned the sale of bumpers. We were considering similar legislation in New York, which uh, I don't believe passed. Um, but it's a balance of is the evidence there to support banning or taking the product off the market, or is it just coincidental that the products themselves exist in a setting where a child may may have died anyway? So crib bumpers could be a lecture in and of itself. Um, this is an example of how the CPSC actually does an analysis of these cases. Now, this is, I'm, I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to go a little faster. I, I found this to be kind of a cool case study. So in the field of forensic pediatrics, we know that infants can have femur fractures from playing in what's called an infant stationary activity center called an exercise. And I'm actually putting this, um, this right on my slide because it's a published publication back in 2001 that is widely known. So if we get a case of a child with certain scenarios, certain types of fractures that comes in with a history of playing in an extra saucer, that is on the differential of a possible explanation. Um, that paper had two case reports. One of them I put up here. This was 1996. The child for two days was really irritable. The pediatrician noticed some swelling. The femur film showed an acute distal femur fracture. The mechanism was felt to be consistent with the use of an extra saucer because the parents brought it to the hospital and actually said they hadn't adjusted the height of the seat in conjunction with uh, the size of the growing child. And they demonstrated it and the doctor and the child protective service workers and police and everybody felt it was consistent and they were published on um, two published case reports on that. So what I did, you can tell I like to Google and do that stuff, uh, I went, onto Google and said, can, I, can my child get a fracture from an extra saucer? And what comes up as the second thing is, uh, that, is that paper. So then I went on to the web and I went onto the website that they sell this and I just said, hi, you know, I'm chatting. Hi, I was wondering if kids, and this lady did a very good job. I was wondering if kids can get fractures of their legs from the extra saucer. I read that this is possible. I want to prevent it. She said, we never received a call of this occurring with any of our extra saucer mo 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 models. I said, well, what about this I found online from the American Academy of Pediatrics? And I sent her the link. And she said, we would advise to use the product per instructions and read the warning information. Um, to make a long story short, she did a really good job. She sent me the manual. She said that they meet all federal guidelines. You know what? They do. They did. And their warning was amazing. Allow only the baby's toes to touch the floor and don't let the child stand flat-footed on the floor. And as the baby grows and becomes more active, raise the tray to the next level, etc. So yes, a child can have an injury. We know that they can have an injury, but this will reflect in proper use of the product. So I, I, I really love, I love this example. Uh, moving on to bath seats. Infant bath seats are used in a tub or sink to support a seated infant once he or she is being bathed. Um, I'm going to go a little faster because of time. These are two examples of bath seats. And there is a tremendous safety concern, and we've seen a number of fatalities due to the false sense of security a bath seat gives to parents. Um, over 90% of deaths with bath seats occurred when children were unsupervised because drowning can occur in as little as seconds in five centimeters of water, and you don't hear anything. Drowning is not like you see on TV. It is a silent event. Um, there were CPSC uh, modifications and, uh, and um, standards with warning labels, and that there had to be a certain leg opening and tilt, uh, tilt testing. Um, and they do have warning labels on them. Unfortunately, we really know that they're still uh, still out there. And I just pulled up some examples of bath seats that I found on the internet. 
um, and you saw in your activity out there. A survey of bathing practices is from a 2007 study showed that 5% uh, of parents left 6 to 12 months old unsupervised, 9% of parents would be more willing to leave a child unsupervised in a bath seat, and only about a third said their pediatrician had actually reviewed this kind of safety information with them. So the question is, is that neglect? And we're facing that a lot in the field of forensic pediatrics. When a child actually dies being unsupervised in a bath seat, so is it neglect? Is it an accident? And we take each case by case. Is it the fault of the product? Well, I, I, I think we have to take that on a case by case basis. So in summary, every case is different. You need to consider the development of the child, usage, supervision, research, evaluate each case in exquisite detail, understand additional sources of information that may be available to you as an attorney when you're analyzing these cases. And in terms of damages, I also I'll do some life care planning, understanding outcomes after hypoxic injury or other brain injury, the long-term effects of skin injury, and the long-term effects of fractures, always knowing that pre-existing conditions um, can also you know, impact a child who for example, might have a disability and also might get injured, you need to consider that when assessing uh, the damages and outcomes in your cases. And I think that's it. Perfect timing. Thank you for having me. I think we're open for questions. Yeah, and just as a reminder to everybody attending the uh, webinar, you can submit your questions uh, via the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, you should be able to see a uh, questions widget on your screen. Uh, and you can just type your questions in there and uh, Dr. Cantor will be able to answer. Um, so we'll just take a, take a moment or so here to see uh, to give people a chance to submit their questions. Um, I think Dr. Cantor did, did an excellent job. There is a lot of information that was covered. So I'm sure that we'll have a number of uh, great questions uh, in the next minute or so coming in. And yeah, we should allow for about 10 minutes of uh, question and answer time. Uh, so once again, go ahead and fill in your questions in the question widget on uh, the GoToWebinar platform, and uh, Dr. Cancer will be able to answer from there. I can't see where that widget is. Can you help me here? <laughs> <laughs> so in the right-hand side, uh, if you go out of your full screen mode and you can see the... Uh, oh, okay, wait. Escape. What am I doing here? Um, okay, there we go. Wait, I'm going to stop showing my screen, right? Can you just read me the questions? <laughs> sure, I can handle it that way as well. That's fine by me. Um, let me just see it as they come in here. So I guess I have a, a question. Um, you know, you really did cover a lot of uh, a lot of products in the presentation overall. It was very comprehensive. Um, are there any products or classes of products that are somewhat new to market um, that weren't mentioned in your presentation that you think might uh, pose some dangers uh, to use in infants and toddlers? Well, absolutely, and and you know, I, I obviously won't mention products by, by name, but browsing around the baby stores, you clearly see where the, the interface between what is known not to be safe, but is still on the market and might be portrayed on a television show or an advertisement, or you see that your friend has it, um, and can be very confusing for the consumer. And yes, there's, there's plenty around there. Uh, in, in the baby stores now that do not conform with what we know, especially in the area of safe infant sleep, to be um, to be safe. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are there any? I'm, I'm not sure if you covered this uh, in your presentation directly, uh, but are there any guides or resources available to attorneys that you know of uh, that sort of cover some of the you know? safety standards and testing methodologies that are used to establish those standards for these uh, these types of products? Certainly. Well, everything is available through Consumer Product Safety Commission. It's, it's a fantastic, uh, it's a plethora of information, easily accessible. You also can do um, 
used the American Academy of Pediatrics, all all of the policy standards will reference different products, what, what's safe, what's not safe. Um, and, and most of this information is actually available simply through the internet. Everything I got on here is also accessible through general internet searches. Okay, great. We do have a question here. I'll read it aloud to you and you can feel free to respond verbally. Um, this is related to a uh, question for you. Uh, have you worked with any cases involving injury or death of a child involving a, a boppy pillow for, quote, tummy time? If so, what are the well-established restrictions for the use of the pillow? Well, I'm not going to actually, I don't want to use a brand name, but, but a good five minutes of the presentation was about infant support pillows. And read between the lines, that's what those are. So um, yes, I've reviewed a number of cases involving infant support pillows. I wouldn't be able to really comment on the specifics outside the scope of what I did in the presentation. Um, but it's, it, it's seen a lot of uh, fatalities and near fatalities that involve all kinds of soft bedding, soft pillows, things used for uh, use in that capacity. And that brand name is one of them. Okay, we have a uh, we have another question here. Uh, what can you tell us about the safety of infant slings? That's a good question. Well, a child should be sleeping alone on the back and on a, on a on a firm surface. And there's a lot of controversy uh, in you know the the sling users versus the traditional what is safe sleep. Um, there have been uh, cases that I personally have evaluated where there's been overheating in slings. I've also, uh, you know, analyzed times when children have died in various unsafe sleep uh, situations where the child wasn't flat on the back, and a sling would be an example of that kind of product. So um, we need to know a little more details, but yes, that a sling does not follow the traditional safe sleep guidelines set forth by the American Academy of Pediatrics because the child isn't laying flat on the back. Okay, and we'll, uh, we'll wait another, uh, another moment or two here uh, to see if there are any additional questions. Um, just in the meantime, for some housekeeping at the end of the webinar, um, if you would like to retain Dr. Kentner, as an expert witness, please feel free to get in touch with us over here at the Expert Institute. Uh, we'd be happy to facilitate the engagement process for you. Um, and just a little bit more about us here at the Expert Institute. Uh, we're able to support um, a full range of expert search requests. Uh, we have 10 MDs as well as more than 30 researchers on staff uh, in three offices around across the country. Um, we're really able to you know, find you the best expert for any case in any area of practice. Um, the webinar is also being recorded. Uh, so we plan to have a recording of this webinar as well as a copy of all the slides out to the attendees uh, within the next few days, probably early next week. Uh, and in addition, if there are any subjects that you would like to see covered in future webinars, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're very appreciative of feedback and any suggestions of things that you would like to see covered. Um, I also recommend that you go to theexpertinstitute.com and check out our resources section. Uh, we have a number of previous expert webinars, uh, as well as white papers and other resources to help you work with expert witnesses more effectively. Um, and it looks like that might be it for questions. Uh, so once again, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Cancer, for an excellent presentation. Um, I'm sure everybody here learned a lot. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this webinar. Thank you.